God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley, of death and dying I will not fear cause you with me you with me your shepherd staff comforts me you are my feast in the presence of enemies Surely goodness will follow me, follow me in the house of God forever. House of God forever. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields green with quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you with me, you with me. Your shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me. Follow me in the house of God forever. House of God forever. Your shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me, follow me, in the house of God forever, the house of God forever, the house of God forever, the house of God forever. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope, there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life 
break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety Captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is sealing, your name is light. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. shadows burn like a fire shout Jesus from the mountains shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is sealing, your name I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes new life is born Jesus is calling 
Hope come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Hope come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord. Of all, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with. The precious blood of Jesus Christ Who oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Father in heaven, we come before you this afternoon and we give this service, the rest of it to you. Just pray that by your spirit, that you just guide the pastor as he speaks to us, Lord. We just need to hear from you. We just give the rest of this time to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Afternoon. Can you hear me okay, Aaron? Thank you. You know, there's an old story about, if you know what the pastor struggles with the most, listen to what he talks about the most. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about patience. You know, um, many years ago when I was married to my first wife, and she was a Jewess, and she asked me one time, would you like to go to a B'nai B'rith? which is the young Jewish people get together and meet them. And because out of curiosity, I said, yes, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I did go and I found out that the Jewish males have a tendency to place you or classify you by what you do for a living. And I resented that. I have to admit that. 
well, what school did you go to and what do you do for a living? And that predicated who you were in their life. Well, I've been to some schools, but I think probably the most difficult school that I've been to is the University of De Adversity. And all of us have probably been there at some time in our life. Paul addressed that very thing in Philippians 4. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but out of the goodness of his heart, Pastor Troy was here and did worship this morning. And just as in the, the reason behind it, and this person I do want to lift up in prayer is Norma, who is the pianist, the accompanist for Marilyn and Daryl Miller, and she has a history of health problems. And recently, her high blood pressure has been giving her a great deal of trouble. And so she's asked if she could have the summer off. And so if we don't mind, I'd like for you to join with me and let's lift up Norma's and her health in prayer. And Father God, thank you so much that we can come before you at this time and lift up our precious sister to you and her health. Lord Norma suffers from a, a myriad case of maladies, but Lord, the one that seems to be giving her the most now is her blood pressure. Our Lord, our prayer is that the doctors be granted the wisdom to make corrections to the symptoms that she's exhibiting. She loves so much the music that, but it's been such a problem to her that she's asked to take the sabbatical, Father. And so in, in this short period of time that she's apart from us, I ask that you, you bless her with healing of her body and that peace will be with her and upon her. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I ask that you anoint the words that I speak, that I speak with clarity, that they're received with clarity and with the intention of but one thing, and that's to bring glory to you, Lord. Use me as your instrument, as you see fit. In your precious name I pray, amen. Yeah, the University of Adversity. In chapter four of Philippians, verses 11 through 13, you were reminded that contentment was not something that came natural to Paul. He had to learn how to be content. In other words, he had to practice. Much like Norma, when she played the piano, she had to practice. Paul was essentially enrolled in the University of Adversity. So what were some of the courses that Paul had to take, and we also have to take at that particular university? One, a course on various kinds of adversity. James tells us all to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, excuse me, the testing of your faith does produce patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, James tells us that trials have a divine purpose. Turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. I'll get there. Of the Jews, <clears throat> five times received I forty stripes save one. Verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods, 
Once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, verse 26, and journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heath, and in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Course two, on how the Lord would always be with him in every adversity. If you follow Paul's journey recorded in the book of Acts, how he frequently faced opposition, everywhere he went, the Judaizers or the legalists seemed to be there. But if you will also notice, the Lord was teaching Paul the way to contentment through these trials. In Acts 18, 9, 10, and 11, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Outwardly, Paul's life was plagued by various problems, but inwardly, he had perfect peace because he knew that God was always with him. The third course on how our faith can become stronger with each and every adversity. Christian values such as patience, endurance, confidence, and contentment are not qualities that the Lord can quickly bestow on us. They have to be developed in each and every one of us. A young cub reporter working for a local paper typed up an article, submitted it to the editor, and the editor read it and says, what is this? You come to me with a house caught on fire because the truck ran into it. We don't run this kind of stuff in our newspaper. This is ridiculous. I don't understand. Take it back and do something else. The young recorder, reporter said to him, he says, I don't know how you could be so content about it. It was your house. How true it is that trials cannot be avoided, but trials can be used to our advantage. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, and we're all familiar with that verse, and we all know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. God has a reason for our trials. And today I want to share with you three things. The reason for trials, the resource for trials, and the rewards of trials. The reason for trials. James 1, 1. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The gaining of patience. Often you will hear people pray, Lord, give me patience. Oh, often I've said that, and Yvonne says, be careful. Yet the Lord doesn't give patience. The Lord produces patience. Patience is not something that we can possess separate from our character. Patience, or the lack of it, is evidence of our character. In order for us to have more patience, God has to change our character. And how's he going to do that? James 1, in the second verse, says, My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Here James speaks of diverse temptation. 
That means various kinds of trials and testing. James was writing to Jewish Christians who were being heavily persecuted. God was using persecution to produce more patience in their lives, and often he uses various forms of troubles to do the same in our lives as well. We don't really like it too very much, do we, when we face these trials? Various times in my life, I can recall that God would bring a trial into my life, and I learned from early on not to say why, because God would say, wrong question. The reason would say, God wanted me to say was, Lord, what is it that I should be learning from this? The question we might ask, how can trouble produce patience in my life? First, we need to know and understand what patience is. Well, patience, as it's referred to in the Bible, is not an indifference to all that's going on around us. Patience is the ability to endure and remain steadfast even during difficult circumstances. There are two words used in the New Testament to describe spiritual patience. There's one word that refers to someone who's able to remain capable under a heavy load. The other is a word describing one who's able to put up with a difficult person. Both of these qualities must be produced in us, and the only way God can produce them is by taking us through a difficult situation the testing of your character. But we all know that a world-class athlete has to practice over and over, spends an enormous amount of time conditioning themselves. Not only work on their skills, but they have to work on stamina. They develop the skills and stamina through rigorous physical activity and a proper diet. God uses the same principles in each and every one of us to develop our spiritual strength and stamina. Hebrews 12, verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. From the Greek word translated as exercise, we get the English word gymnasium. God puts us on the treadmill of tribulation in order to produce in us spiritual stamina. James tells us the trying of your faith worketh patience. God tests and tries our faith, often to the point of breaking in order to make us strong. Sometimes people will say, don't pray for patience because God will send you trouble. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in my life. But before you bail out, look at James 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. That which... He is tried. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In other words, there's a great reward for those who allow God to develop in them this attribute of patience. Gain of patience. James tells us that there's an eternal gain in heaven for those who faithfully endure their earthly trials. Don't give up. God is awaiting them a crown of life, but there's also an immediate gain for those who are able to endure. That is the gain of contentment. As an example, look at Philippians 4.11. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. When I was growing up, and I was first married, same thing almost, we called those the hungry years. 
when he always had more month than money. A time of trusting in something other than yourself because it was the only resource we had. It was awful easy to give up, just throw your hands up and say, I don't know, and walk away. And today, sadly, we have generations doing just that, throwing up their hands and walking away from the responsibilities that they have in life. And I'm not speaking just financially, but I'm speaking of life in general. We can't do those things, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in white, want, excuse me. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. God had developed in Paul a spiritual maturity. I want to deviate for just a moment. We've all been told in our lives, and I think we all understand, God has placed within each and every one of us a vacuum. And it's in that vacuum is that desire for God. Now, many people, for so many years, I ignored the vacuum, and I, no doubt maybe some of you did the same. But that vacuum was always there. There was always that yearning. I didn't quite understand what I was missing. And I knew my, my late wife from the age of 10. And at the age of 10, as I mentioned, she was a Jew. She al she's always said to me, I know there is something missing in Judaism. And it's much like most of us prior to our time, when we come to know the Lord, we know there's something missing, but we can't quite put our finger on it. Then comes the revelation in life, some of which except and some of which who do not. They fill it with alcohol, drugs, immorality, all the different vices of the world. But they're still searching for God. But they've chosen to shroud themselves in the world instead of opening themselves to God. For many years, I lived my life like that. Not that I was immoral, or evil, but I chose to run from God. Take my word, God will pursue you. There is no place you can be that God does not pursue you. So there is a world, and we understand that world, that is running from that pursuit of God. There's the old saying of, a girl will let you chase her until she catches you. And it's pretty much the same with God. They want Jesus as their Savior, but they don't want Jesus as their Lord. There's a big difference. The patience that James is trying to teach us, the patience that comes from the contentment that only God can bring, and trust me from my own personal experience, that contentment will never come until you submit to God. You submit to that vacuum that is within you. Paul learned through all of the trials, but who was more zealous than Paul in his faith? He thought all that he was doing in trying to destroy Christianity was the right thing until his eyes were opened. Never in Paul's life was there such a thing as contentment until he came to know the Lord. And I can say about Frank's life, it's the same thing. There was never a contentment in Frank's life until he came to know the Lord. James Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. We all know what he's speaking of. The word perfect used in these verses, as it is used here, is to refer to something that has been finished and brought to completion. Well, folks, you've been bought at a great price, and the work has been completed, it's finished. Much like Jesus' work was finished 
His work in you will be finished one day. We call that sanctification. It's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong learning curve. Most of us are still on the uphill side of that learning curve. I know that I am. And part of that is he's teaching me to be patient, patient about a number of things. Spiritual maturity is what I seek in my life, and I believe all of you seek in your life. It is the tying of our faith that produces this maturity and thus makes us complete and entire and lacking in nothing. Nothing reveals our level of spiritual maturity more than a trial. How do you react? Trials prove our character, but they also can produce, but they can also produce your character. Do you grow from what you've learned, the trials you've gone through? In other words, have you learned? Refer again to James 1, 2, and 3. Again, he talks about how trials produce spiritual maturity. Remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4? I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. It was a process that Paul had to go through repeatedly. First, God had to strip him of all of his strength. And it's the same with each and one of you. Each and every one of us had to be stripped of all of our strength. That's called pride. I had to be broken before I could be built up, much like a bodybuilder says. We have to be a completely empty vessel. And we've talked about this at communion. Do you come to communion as an empty vessel, free from unconfessed sin, to be in a proper place at the time? Then God built him up again by his grace. And it's the same with each and every one of you. After a lifetime of going through this process, Paul was the last able to explain, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Andrea Crouch was a black gospel singer and writer. I won't sing to you, I promise, but I would like to read to you the words of a song that you all know. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I don't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. Trials alone can't perfect you. In the midst of trials, we must find a strength that can carry us through. Andrea Cow said, I've learned to depend upon his word. James described this as God's wisdom. James 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberal, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What God is saying, ask as many times as you want, and I'll paraphrase, and I won't hold it against you. Come to me repeatedly. Come to me, and I will always answer you. Fear not. I am here for you. God's wisdom will be freely given, but in order to profit from his wisdom, you have to receive it in faith. James 1, 6 says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How often have you heard someone say, if you don't believe in your prayers, why did you bother? 
When God reveals the deep things to us, we have to receive them. We have to depend on his word. To reject his revealed wisdom is to remain unstable in all our ways. The sea and wind of our adversity will toss us, and we will receive no help from the Lord. Rewards of trials, heavenly blessings. James 1.9 says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof faileth. And the grace of the fashion of it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessing of the low, and that God will lift him up. Blessing of the high, and that God will bring him low. It's easy to see how the, the low is lifted up and blessed, but how is the high blessed when he is brought low? His loss of earthly riches may seem confusing at this moment, but the eventual loss of earthly riches is certain in eternity. This requires an explanation. Suppose that God only prospered us with earthly riches and never caused us to need him. Would you call, consider that a curse or a blessing? If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. Let's read verses 6 through 10. But great godliness with containment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world that is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves with many sorrows. There's immediate blessing of knowing that during trials, God is doing something eternal in your life. There's also the eternal blessing that awaits us in glory. James 1, verse 12 says that, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to him that love him. There's two types of crowns mentioned in Scripture. A diadem, which is the crown of royalty, and a stephanos, which is the crown of someone who has won a victory. The crown spoken of here in James is the stephanos, the crown of victory. Through the trials we experience in our life, are not pleasant at the time of happening, they can bring you a great reward. There is the immediate reward of a developing spiritual maturity, and there is the eternal reward of knowing through Christ we are able to do all things through him who strengthens us. I originally had written the message quite a bit longer, and I decided that I would divide it into two parts. And the second part we'll enter in next week, and it's, it's basically a continuation because for every positive or every negative, there's a positive. That doesn't mean, I don't mean to say that for every blessing there's a curse. That's not my point. My point is just that in order to balance things, you need to see all of it, both sides, if you will. In 
And I know that we're going to be, as I say, a somewhat abbreviated message, but yesterday I received in the mass media something that, and in reading it, it saddens me a great deal, but there's, I guess I'm going to get just a little bit personal here. And if God ever set out to make God, excuse me, if America ever set out to make God unhappy, we've done a fine job. Many decades ago, Ruth Bell Graham said that if God ever fails to punish America, then he owes, she owes, or excuse me, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. When we look at what's going on in our world today, Some of the things we spoke about, the immoralities, the deviations. We point our finger at everybody, but where it should be pointed, and that's the Christian community. We alone are the ones that are responsible. In essence, we are God's chosen people. And he's the ones that puts his trust in us. I heard people say, it must have been wonderful to live in the times of Jesus. Well, folks, I got news for you. You are. You are living in the time of Jesus. The church age is still here, folks. Yes, things have changed. But the reality of it all is we're still waiting. We're still waiting, just as they always have. It breaks my heart to see how the country that all of us grew up in, were born in, and see the things that are going on here today. And I hear people say, and I'm talking about pastors also say, we need a revival, but you have to have one prerequisite before you can have that revival, and it's called redemption. We have... Many, many, many who are willing to do most of what they need to do instead of all of what they need to do. We have to turn all of ourselves back to what we say we are. We're willing to give up most of our sins, but that won't get it done. We have to learn to give up all the sins we can, all of them. Some say, well, what are you saying, Frank? I'm saying that we give lip service to Christianity, and we can't do that. That will never appease God. We've all been given the Great Commission. It's not just a job. It's a life, because you might save a life. When I think about how we can point our finger at the administrations or this or this or this, God says, I will send. Well, we all know in the book of Matthew, he talks about wars and rumors of wars. We'll always have those, and we do. We look at the times of going on in Jerusalem. That isn't any different. He says, I will send plagues and pestilence as well, and pandemics. If you go back into the book of Daniel or into, and read about the prophecies in, in the last chapter in the book of Daniel, when knowledge will increase, knowledge is increasing. And that's one of the more misunderstood verses in, in, the, in the Bible. And people say, well, that means we're getting smarter? Well... Depends on who you talk to. But a lot of knowledge increasing is that maybe it's the knowledge of prophecy that's increasing. Knowledge of knowing what's coming, and we all know what's coming. It's the Christian community is responsible not only for the Christian community, but for the condition of the world. 
We have abdicated so much of our responsibility, and I've said this from this pulpit before, and I can't help it because it's a fact. What are you doing? What are you doing to help win the battle? I have to ask myself that question all the time. The Christian world, we need to wake up. We need to be willing to repent of all of our sins, all of them. And give it all back to Jesus. He died for them. Would you stand, please? Simple question. And I heard the pastor say it at our meeting the other day when we were speaking to communion. It's a simple thing called reverence. Do we stand in reverence of the Lord? Reverence of what we tr truly believe in as Christians? I sincerely hope so. Join with me in prayer, please. Father, thank you so much that we can come into this place, this place dedicated to you and to your holy name. So can we expound upon your word your, and glean the wisdom from your very words? Lord, I ask that you hold us responsible and that we be responsible to do the work that you have assigned to us and to cherish you as the Father and the Creator of all things. You are not only just our Savior, but our Lord. And may we live our lives as you are not just our Savior, but our Lord's. Father, may each of us be deeper in the Word. Glean from those very words the meaning of life as it applies to you. And as we leave here this day, that we go out into this world with but one thought, Father, and that's to bring glory to you. We've all been given the gospel, but not to keep within, but to share with others. Lord, anoint each and every one of us with the words to speak. When you open the window and you bring across our path, one who desires to hear the word, one with a vacuum that needs the unfilling of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And so, Lord, I give your precious children to you for safekeeping, for safe travel as they leave this place. Watch over them, Father, as only you can, as a hen gathers the chicks beneath her wing. Protect them, Lord. In your precious holy name I pray, amen and amen.